welcome to the Revenue Insights podcast for this week. Uh, and today I'm joined by Darren Fay. He's the Director of Revenue Operations and Intelligence at Instructure. Over the past two and a half years, Darren has helped to scale the RevOps team, having previously worked at Clarabeam. It's great to speak to you, Darren. Great to speak to you as well, Lee. So to kick us off, it'd be great to hear a little bit more about your story, um, your story over at, um, over at Instructure, and how you've got to where you are today. Yeah, you bet. I have a bit of a unique career path. Uh, originally, stepping into school, I, was, I wanted to go to school to be a fireman, so I went to school to be a fireman. Spent some time working over at uh, 29, 29 Palms Fire Department, and I also did reservist work um, over at Orange County Fire Authority. Loved that. It was um, a dream. Loved working in that job. Uh, decided we are going to move to uh, Utah to live in a safer community, my wife and I, after we got married. And uh, in moving to Utah, uh, they don't really pay firemen very well. <laughs> and so I decided to start over my career and kind of kick off, uh, you know, working in a similar role to what I had when I was younger, which was back in a sales role and uh, enjoyed it. I forgot that I had a passion for it. And um, throughout, you know, up until I came into Instructure, I spent time working in various sales jobs, sales leadership, uh, sales and operations leadership, and then... Uh, you know, got the opportunity to go into a smaller company, uh, Clarivine, which is like a marketing data governance uh, software, where um, I was able to build a, a business development department as well as a revenue operations function within that organization. Um, it's there where I kind of built the passion for RevOps and um, decided to kind of harness my focus around RevOps, and which brought me to Instructure. Nice. And given, I think you've had two years and six months now in structure. Um, it'd be great to hear um, a bit more around um, what the structure of the revenue op- operations function looks like. We were kind of touching beforehand just on the on the size of the business and, uh, and structure. So it'd be great to get a bit of context of, you know, perhaps a bit more about like the hierarchy and where you sit in it. Yeah, you bet. So we have um, basically a revenue operations function as well as an enterprise systems function that um, sits in a different of the organization or I would look at our enterprise systems um, organization as more of like our uh, architectural work um, where they actually do the um, getting their hands dirty and building out the um, the framework for a lot of the systems and uh, they also manage the underlying data structure for like our data warehousing and things of that nature the um, revenue operations function we have multiple uh, different areas of focus within the team we have you know our uh, SVP of revenue operations led by Joanna Fankhauser, who um, has split the team into uh, various areas. We have a sales and marketing uh, BI function. We have a marketing uh, function for systems, a sales function for systems, a CX uh, function for systems, and then we also have a uh, CX BI team as well as a. Um, uh, I would call it like a ROI uh, BI team where they focus on the budget and they um, focus on like commissions and things of that nature. So if the dollars are being spent, it's going to be going through the ROI team. And then the uh, the other BI teams like the sales and marketing, uh, which is the team that I run. And then we have our CX BI team. I would focus that more on like um, insights, analytics, business intelligence, go to market, annual operating plans, um, recommendations to systems for um, making sure that it facilitates the needs that we do have for making the decisions we need to make as an organization. And the systems team would be more of a function of like the administration and day-to-day um, maintenance of um, some of the plans that are put in place. Mm. What I love is really like how um, uh, how it's really broken down. Uh, a lot of the time, um, I think there's a lot of revenue operation teams, either it's you know an in- a single individual or you know, perhaps it then breaks out then into a second tier of marketing, sales, customer success, typically. It sounds like you've got an even, you know, a, a tier below that now in terms of the structure. So it'd be good to understand, like, as a business unit, how you're working together um, and how how that business unit works with the wider business. Yeah, it's a, it kind of goes into... Um, that those three foundational pillars developing a best in class RevOps team um, that was dis- discussing with you earlier, you know, a big key portion of that is alignment, which is like one of those pillars, which is 
making sure that you work regularly cross-functionally um, in an efficient manner. So when you work with, um, let's say, our enterprise services team, you know, you need to weigh in to have buy-in, right? So you need to be able to include the right people from the right portions of the organization to make sure that you have the right uh, insights to deliver the right results. So um, working on you know, system architectural changes or recommendations. It's not just, you know, me and my team saying, we want to do this. This is what we're going to do. It's um, bringing the right people in the room and discussing it. Similar to like a panel where you say, this is what we'd like to do. Let's start poking holes in it and let's start breaking things. Um, you know, I find we get some of the best solutions from getting in a room, somebody proposing a solution, then we break it. Um, and that's probably how I'd say that we kind of function really well going into, you know, building successful plans. I'd I'd love to get an example of perhaps you know one one problem that you were having, um, perhaps one that you you know that you got great results from. That's probably the best one to go with, right? Um, what the problem was you were having at the beginning, and um, ultimately the solution that you got to, but really how you got there. Yeah, I think one of the problems that um, I, I could use as, a, as an example is. You know, when, when changing like a team structure around, you're looking at doing, let's say, like an overlay model, um, you know, making sure that you get proper attribution for those overlay reps, but also not overcounting um, contribution to the existing rep who runs that account or opportunity. Um, that's complex sales motion to manage and making sure that you have the right uh, framework in, in place and the right process in place to manage it can be tedious. Uh, you know, you got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet, right? So if you're not making mistakes, then you're not doing something right. Uh, you know, first implementing things, you know, you have some growing pains, you understand what not to do. And, you know, that builds on the foundation to make a more successful and meaningful plan. The people who come up with some of the best decisions in revenue operations don't do it just because they had a random idea. It's because they've done it wrong two, three, four times until they found out the right way to do it. Um, coming up with those solutions and, you know, mitigating those, it's all about, you know, reviewing the past successes and failures and doing a postmortem and saying, what can we do differently? And what are the areas that were painful for us? In that situation, we, we looked at, um, you know, one of the pains we had from the previous plan we put together was, was manual, the audits that had to take place and things of that nature. And so coming together as a team now, it's, it's um, for, for next year, you know, one of the things we want to look at is how do we automate more of that, um, we believe the framework is airtight, but it's more about how do we reduce the the time it takes to manage it. And, you know, again, you break a few eggs, so you're going to have to, you're going to notice new problems that they come up. You're going to solve one and you're going to build on it until you kind of fine tune it to the right solution. Mm. Is there any, um, uh, <laughs> any broken eggs that stand out from that process that, you know, you really took the biggest learning from? Yeah, I definitely think, um, the area of opportunity of understanding, you know, the nuances with um, the extenuating circumstances. You know, you have new things that happen throughout the year. Um, you know, an acquisition or of some sort that could throw a wrench in something, and you, you do the best you can in revenue operations to kind of mitigate a lot of the um, the nuances, the, the special cases that can come up that can cause something to get you know, cost off, uh, cast off the rails, but, um, it's how you handle it when they come forward. Right. So, you know, understanding how to integrate a new piece and a new complexity to the business is, um, you know, as when I referenced earlier, getting in a room and just breaking things, that's, that's kind of the, the motion that I like to focus on is what if this happens? Uh, what if this happens? Um, what if we do another acquisition? What if there's another business model that comes in? How do we um, see this uh, as being a scalable solution and just trying to break through every possible scenario you can? And you're never going to get it all. But then building in safeguards to say, hey, if we miss everything, if we got everything and we, there's still something that slips through, what do we have to catch this? And making sure we mitigate it. Yeah. You mentioned earlier around the, the three pillars, really, of uh, you know best-in-class RevOps team. And, and we've talked a little bit through alignment of those teams. So I'm interested to know then, what would you consider to be the two other pillars? Yeah, so the two other pillars um, outside of alignment would be uh, coaching and professional development. And, you know, when we're looking at, you know, leading a revenue operations teams, there's, there's several things that happen, right? You have 
burnout, you have confusion, you have a lot of things, you get pulled in different directions. And, you know, one of the people that I mentor uh, over in London, you know, when you hear from other businesses, some of the struggles that they have, well, oftentimes it comes from not having clear vision. And clear vision from your leadership could impact your clear vision from your own personal revenue operations um, priorities. So um, when I talk about that first pillar, when I talk about alignment, it's really about understanding what's important in the organization and what's important to the EC and your senior leadership team. And, you know, if you don't have a clear vision, pushing to get that clear vision, because if they don't have a clear vision, then the company's not going in the right direction. And everyone needs to be marching in the right direction. So you can get alignment across those um, areas and then making sure you document um, throughout the way so that there's, you know, transparency across what's important so that you can always refer, refer back to, you know, where should my priorities lie at the, the given time. I would love to know um, if you, what I'm really interested to know is in, um, in Instructor's example, you know, it'd be good to hear what that vision is and perhaps some actionable examples of how that then filters down into how you're operating as a team. Yeah, I think, you know, for us, you know, we, we definitely have some of our core principles, but, um, you know, we want to be, you know, at money is head tech company. Yeah, we definitely want to be, you know, looking at being an amazing place to work. You know, we want to make sure we're having um, a raving fan base across uh, our customers and having a um, great customer success story and we're, we're driving value to our, our end users. When we look at um, our connection with that from the RevOps team, one of the things that I, I believe it's foundational in like running that best-in-class revenue operations team is aligning your team objectives with that. Um, are you familiar with uh, OKRs, the goal setting principles? You know, I really like those. Um, and for those who don't know it, it's objectives and key results. Um, it was introduced to me by uh, my boss, uh, Joanna Fankhauser. And, and in going through that, it, it gives clarity on you know what that overall vision is, and then how are you going to get there, and what's the measurable result? You know, having it be time bound and, and specific, and um, giving you that that spearheaded vision of how you're going to impact the organization and deliver on your company's commitments um, from a more granular view. You know, one of the things that um, I think is important with that alignment is you know discussing things. Um, that you're uh, working on and making sure you have transparency in them. And so doing the OKR uh, ritual or, or, or process from the top down, I think is meaningful, right? And having transparency in that. So everyone knows where your priorities lie at that given time. In, in doing so, you know, I, I find you have less questions and uh, about like, what am I doing here from a, a employee perspective? And it, it really drives value in knowing what's important. The um, kind of bouncing around a little bit, the coaching aspect of those, those three pillars, one of the things that kind of aligns with that is, you know, you doing OKRs for the individual reps and making sure that they understand what what's expected of them and what they are going to work on, but allowing them to come up with that, right? You allow them to say, this is the company missions. What, what do you want to do to impact it? And giving them the freedom to decide how they're going to impact the organization um, within the in the scope of what it is that our mission statement is. And then going from there to um, ensuring that the team understands what their success looks like and having them do, we, we do something internally called success statements. And having the um, team member, I would refer to them as a team rather, member rather than employee, but going in and putting in uh, what their mission statement is uh, for their role. So what is, what's their purpose here? Why are they here? Uh, and then, you know, understanding what the success looks like in their role. And then um, what are some KPIs to help them define if they've been successful? So how, how would you measure measure that? And, you know, it gets forgotten sometimes. When you go into work and you have a list of things to do, let's say you have a laundry list of things that you need to accomplish, you've done it. How do you go home in the end of the day feeling satisfied? Like you've done good and you've been successful. Well, most people don't know um, unless you help them define what success looks like. So if they can go into their day and they can have clear, defined direction for understanding, hey, this is what um, success looks like for me, they can 
find that point in time where they can feel satisfied with the work they've done and they can feel like they have brought value to the organization in a meaningful way. I think that's obviously extremely important. And um, uh, I found something similar here at Ebster, you know, also using OKRs of having the clarity of how, you know, targets at the very top ultimately filter down to different units. So as you were talking, something that I was kind of curious around. So you mentioned at the beginning that um, in your role, you're kind of overseeing operations with sales and marketing. So do your OKRs align with um, with th- their OKRs, i.e. in terms of pipeline generated, revenue closed, and I assume then is broken out? Yeah, exactly. So I will set mine um, from a perspective of what, you know, is in alignment with the leaders that we support. You know, how I have some of my team members broken out on the sales side is I have somebody who manages our international RevOps um, teams. They support our um, our SVP of uh, global sales. And we have somebody for our North America, high ed and North America K-12 division because our North America uh, portion of the business is... Um, well, there's more people to support in that region. Um, from there, they would align theirs with their leaders and... Um, align with also the revenue operations goals. So it could be a difficult process um, to make sure that you're aligning across the organization. But I think what what helps is, you know, you having regular conversations about what priorities are, which is, you know, another area of that coaching aspect and being that meaningful team is having regular weekly conversations to talk about what those priorities are. Um, one of the things I like to do with my team is uh, each uh, Monday morning, we go over our, our weekly team meetings and we kick the week off and one of the things I make sure I document and highlight is, hey, this is what's important to me right now and the senior leadership team and the organization. These are where I see your priorities. Will you tell me where you see your priorities and align across the two? Um, in some cases, mine might get trumped by something that they have that they're working on on their end. And having that open conversation about what that priority should be for the week and then making sure that they have guidance on what is that priority for that week um, to make sure that they know if nothing else happens, this is what is um, going to drive the most impact. Mm. The the coaching side of things is such an interesting one because um, that's often sometimes where you get a lot of friction between operations and and reps. And by the sounds of it, you've really got over a lot of those uh, speed bumps, I'd say, to get to where you are now. So what would you say is the, the secret to, to coaching reps and really getting them on board with not only the value that revenue operations brings, but ultimately can help to bring to them as well. Yeah, I think we'll, um, we're fortunate to have a really good relationship with our um, our sales team. And I think a lot of that comes down from, you know, two things that I think are important, you know, looking at the reps and the leadership team as a customer. Um, you know, you're looking at, you know, the sales rep, they have to treat their customers a certain way because they need to satisfy their customer. We also need to look at them and um, treat them as a customer. And you also have to kind of have a balancing act because in a lot of cases in the, those RevOps roles, there's multiple stakeholders and multiple customers that have and sometimes competing views. And by making sure that you're building the alignment and of priorities and explaining the uh, reasoning behind the alignment of what you're working on, you know, oftentimes clears up a lot of the concerns around like why something else is getting, getting done for somebody else and it is for uh, this person. Because you can define the value and you understand the value and you can communicate it and you can work through it. But also realizing that in some cases, when somebody is asking for something, they don't necessarily want it, um, it as, as the end result. They just want to be heard. And so if you can take the time to listen and you know repeat back to them so you, they are aware of uh, you listening to them and taking that information and you know being honest with them and being transparent and saying, hey, listen, this may not happen in the way you're thinking, but... We'll take a look at it, and this is what may come in, in a different way, but we'll take a look at it and see what it is. And then one of the things that I like to do is push back on value. So if we were to do this, what are we going to do with it? Um, what is the action going to be? Is it something that's going to be driving um, a meaningful result? And then that way you can understand and kind of prioritize across like the impact of the business. Mm. And that actually kind of brought me on to where I was going to take this next, which is from a prioritization perspective, um, certainly within how you're working as reps, but also more more broadly within within your role and within the business. Are those 
is that prioritization based off of business impact at the end of the day? Um, and I guess more specifically, how do you then make that cool? Uh, you know, because to me, in my head, it's, you know, you've got a project and it's, this is what we're estimating in terms of the impact of it. I guess a little bit more insight into what the decision making process is that you have to prioritize. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I think the, the main area is collecting the right amount of context from each request, right? One of the things we do here to eliminate like one-off requests or um, more time-consuming uh, ac- activities would be we do office hours for um, rep level uh, people. So twice a week, we have a, a, an hour um, session where people can freely join and come get some of their questions answered and get some tasks worked on. Outside of that, we primarily focus on working with leaders and we focus on, hey, if they have something that they need, um, first go talk to your leader and let's see if your leader can solve the problem for you. If they can't, um, the leader will come to us. Um, if the leader doesn't deem it valuable in terms of what he's got going on, then we won't hear about it. And then in that situation, the um, reps could still come to uh, office hours to get some of that stuff addressed. So there's always a, um, an option to get something done. But it's done so in a, in a way that helps prioritize what's most important. And then based on those requests we do get from those leaders, we take those into account and we say, hey, this is what I have. Um, I'm going to talk to my boss. I'm going to get my priorities for my boss based on the workload that I've um, gotten from my team. We've evaluated this workload. And then we talk back and I say, okay, listen, this is what we think is feasible within this given time period. If, some, if we need to do this, this has got to drop. And we talk through what um, needs to slip if something does need to be addressed that's more important mm. lovely yeah. i'm interested to take us in a slightly different direction uh having covered the pillars quite a lot already um in the in the here and now and let's say over the you know perhaps over 2022 is there a particular pro- project that you're working on right now that you're um passionate about Oh, every every project I work on, I'm passionate about. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I can't narrow it down. I, I, think, uh, well, I guess yeah. what's top of mind then? Uh, perhaps even that you've been working on today that you're trying to get your head around. Yeah, um, I've just finished a big project, which is our annual operating plan. And, and right now, we're just focused on getting the um, overall territory alignments done based off of the annual operating plan. So we're, we're looking at um, how to deploy each individual region at this point. So... Um, the good news is, you know, I have members on my team who are, you know, infinitely more intelligent than I am, which is wonderful to have, uh, you know, at, at your disposal. And, you know, they're working heavily with their leaders to determine what the best course of action is to go after, you know, their number for the year and how we want to do that as a business. And, you know, making sure I help drive that in the right direction, I think is on top of mind. And in, in doing some of that, I think it comes down to, you know, maintaining those conversations um around you know what our personal our uh, our vision is for next year in terms of like where we want um the company to go so what are our current priorities you know what do we want to be selling and where and how and um what's going to lead us to have the most bang for our buck in terms of productivity yeah I appreciate that we're probably not going to be able to go into too much detail in terms of what you've got planned Mm -hmm. coming up in in the next year but I wonder if if you're able to speak to from annual planning last year, whether there were any key learnings that you took took from that, um, and that, and, and how ultimately it transpired going into 2022 from last year, um, and perhaps learnings that you've now taken going into planning for next year um, that played a key part in shaping that strategy. Yeah, yeah, I, def- I definitely think. Um one of the learnings from last year for, for me was um, making sure that you focus on the data, right? So understanding where you're seeing momentum, where you're seeing the, um, um, the, the tailwinds and leveraging that and making sure you deploy it in the, in the right way to capture it and being careful to focus on, you know, the nuances um, as well. Cause if you get caught, caught up too much in, you know, the general, fact of hey this is a hot area we're going to go into this area you may miss something um you know we did a fairly decent job um last year 
doing that and um, leveraging, I'm not sure how familiar you are with um, like a TAM, SAM, SOM kind of principle of going after, you know, what we have in market, what we want to go after. And um, last year was first time, you know, I, I put my team onto that type of process and pushed them through it. And, you know, it worked out well. And, you know, I think the team is pretty happy with the way it was deployed from the, the sales side of it. And, you know, just looking at refining that further into next year um, with more of like a product centric focus, I think a focus, I think it would be a good, um, good year next year. Mm. Was that spread across, uh, obviously the focus on the TAM, SAM and so on, was that focused across both sales and marketing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would say um, focusing on where the interest is and then, you know, leveraging the marketing function to, to go into those regions for sure. Hmm. And um, uh, I guess by and large then, seeing as you're carrying it forward into, into next year, um, overall was, was a success, I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah, very much so. Um, you know, it, it comes down to some of that, you know, you, you have some of these plans that take quite a bit of time and, in order to do some of these uh, these motions, you know, you can have it one of two ways to do new things, right? You can wait and hire somebody who has experience in it, um, or you can kind of coach up those people and um, focus on development in those areas. And it's kind of where, like, when like we dive into like the other pillar when you talk about professional development, you look at um, prioritizing some of that stuff. You know, in a lot of cases, you see in revenue operations, somebody will come in and they will level up a role because they realize that they couldn't do something that they wanted to do rather than spend the time and allow that person to have some breathing room to develop themselves so that you can take on bigger and newer tasks. And um, focusing on giving somebody and prioritizing the ability to have your team take the moment. And, you know, I, I like my team to block off a half hour today to focus on stretching so um professional development it doesn't necessarily have to be like a 30 minutes a day off of work for training but it has to be three minutes a day that causes them to be stretched it could be a task that they are not super comfortable with that allows them to develop um, a new skill while they're going through the process and it focuses on areas that um they need to you know improve in and when you look at some of the, the coaching sessions which you talked about earlier you know one of the things that um I do do with my team is we do a self skills assessment. So I ask them to go through and rank themselves. It's like a numbering system, and they say, "Okay, this is where I feel like I'm scoring in this particular area." And I ask for them to give context on why they scored themselves that way. And then um, we meet on that. And we say, "Hey, listen, this is your perception of how you are. I'm going to give you some perception about what I think, or maybe others may think." And we go through those areas, and then we leverage that to identify opportunities and. Um, in that process, we take those opportunities and we say we post them on a board. So um, most people may not be super keen on doing this, but you know we post the strengths and we post the opportunities for every person on my team, and including myself. And I ask my team to help me come up with my own opportunities. And we go through that and um, we focus on making those opportunities strengths. And in some aspects, they could be being more strategic in a certain area, which could be uh, met by stretching yourself in a new methodology like a Tam Sam Som where they may have not, a, not done it before. And, um, you know, I think the key to making that work is building trust and letting them know that you're a part of it and also putting your own um, neck out there to kind of highlight your own weaknesses so that you can also work on it and kind of build those up. But, um, you know, I find that's what's enabled us to do some more newer and um, forward thinking motions within our revenue operations organization is because of the focus we have on the development side of things and um, the coaching aspect of it. It's, it's a really interesting approach. And, um, and and to your point, you know, I wonder how many people really appreciate the, uh, the level of transparency. Personally, I really like the concept of it because it gives a clearer sense of what people are strong at and not necessarily what they're weak at, but it's, it's playing to those strengths, right? Um, so, so on your point, with regards to the data, um, it, it's something that, that, that we've been looking at as well. And I would consider myself to be terrible with the spreadsheet. So I look at it and go, this is definitely not playing to my strengths, right? Um, so then it's looking within the business of, you know, someone that is, uh, that way inclined and is far stronger with it to then pick up and run with it. And we've, 
we've personally found a lot more progress with that. And um, by the sounds of it, that's kind of a similar case for for you guys, where I wonder whether, um, obviously, a lot of the time, and we were kind of talking beforehand, you know, it's just you're constantly being inundated with requests request from left, right, and center. But with that personal development in place, do you find that... Um, you almost have like ideas bubbling up from sessions that you are having that, you know, play into those strengths that you, that you then really push forward as, I guess, like a, a more of a pioneering RevOps project. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think that's a big area of it, right? Um, one of the things that I've loved about the process is, you know, you build, you, you take, you disarm the opportunities area or area of somebody from being something that is painful to talk about and it becomes more of a mechanism to help somebody grow and improve. And it takes the negativity out of it, right? When you, when you share it openly and everyone's doing it and it's a part of what it is, and it's not about how bad you are. It's about, Hey, let's look at areas where we can get that much better. And the way I like to talk to my team about it is, you know, the more we improve as an organization, the more responsibility we can take on, the more improvement to the organization we can bring. And if we stop that, you're only as good as the skill set you currently have. And the a company continues to grow and the company continues to develop. But if your workforce doesn't develop and grow along with it, that area of the business becomes stagnant. And, you know, there's so many new areas to develop. Um, you know, you talking about your spreadsheets. You know, when I first came over um, to uh, Instructure, my strong point wasn't like Tableau, for example. And, you know, I put that out there and, you know, now I'm fairly competent in it. And that we go through there and we, we put some of these things forward to the team and we let them know, hey, this is something I'm working on. You identify an area, you know, I'm, I'm very transparent with, you know, I wanted to learn SQL. Uh, so last year, I'm more business focused and strategic focused and I wanted to learn a little bit more technical um, you know, skills. And so I did that alongside it and I was doing trainings with my team and discussing it. and. You know, when you get in the trenches and you develop yourself with the team, they also understand you're building the culture of growth and development. And it leads them to want to be better alongside you as an organization. And, you know, one of the other factors that I, I believe in is doing joint trainings as well and joint professional development to make sure the team stays comp like, uh, competent in like the interpersonal area. And you look at like marriages, right? They say you either grow together or you grow apart. And, um, I think it seems structure is similar to like a marriage, right? You go into an agreement to work together and be together um, and unified across your approach to different um, aspects of the business. And um, one of the things that I, I like to do is I like to focus on like a team training and I let them pick and we go through and discuss together. So this year alone, we've done seven habits for highly effective people. We've done radical candor. We've done crucial conversations. And um, every single time we do one of them, it's nice because you know, we can have a candid conversation and training around it and discuss like how we want to improve. And after every one of the trainings, you always see like some heightened level of, of awareness around that competency that we like developed as a team. And uh, it, it's definitely helps the team be looked at in a different light across the, the business. So that's really interesting. Do, do you share like the, the strengths and the opportunities with the wider business as well? Um, right now, no. Right now, we keep it internally with the um, with the organization. Um, you know, and the only reason I don't, as of right now, is it doesn't necessarily service everyone. But when I do talk through, um, if somebody's asking a question about something, we you know, you know, there's this is some something somebody wants to focus on. For example, um, one person I have who wants to focus more on uh, wants to learn more about the marketing side, and he apparently supports more on the sales side. You know, making sure that he has those opportunities to um, get exposure and work in those areas. And I have one person on my team who uh, is interested in a product uh, route in his career, and um, he's more in the sales portion of it. So making sure that he has the um, the guidance and uh, understanding of like how to get more exposure into certain areas. And you know, I, I live by a principle with um, leadership, which is that you should good talent should have you know three four years, um, and then they should move up and out um, or over right depending on what their uh, career aspirations are and there's going to be a small sub sub segment of some people who just love what they do and that's their job and that's um it's great to retain those types of people as well but the vast majority of the people that you get um 
you know, in your career to work with have some other type of aspiration, whether it be short term or long term. And if you can give um, through your coaching sessions some visibility into the route to get there, you have more meaningful time with that person. Otherwise, you have people who are going to say, well, I'm going to go look at this opportunity. And then you're going to find out two weeks before they leave that they're looking for another job rather than you working hand in hand and their career development is a part of your conversation so that you're a part of the conversations when they do have the opportunities that come forward. And you can, you know, be a good advocate for them. I think you being a good leader and being a good advocate for the people who work with you, you know, leads to more people wanting to work with you and it leads to more development and people staying with you for a more meaningful period of time, you know, air quotes. Because anybody can be sitting in seat for three, uh, four years, but the people who are really developing and really, you know, putting in the work to develop their careers in that three to four years are going to do more meaningful work. Mm. Yeah, 100%. And I think um, the, the development side of things is so interesting because uh, certainly within revenue operations, there's not like a, a central way almost of doing things, right? It's very much dependent on the, on the business needs. And so retaining, you know, um, employees that you've put so much time and, and obviously money into is is so so important. Um, Darren, I know we're running close to time, so I want to ask you a final question now. Um, if you could recommend one book to other revenue la- uh, leaders, which would it be? Um, it'd have to be Crucial Conversations. Uh, the reason I give that book for, for clarity is we. You know, as we talked about earlier, you talk about your um, customer, right? And the leaders that you support, being able to communicate um, difficult topics and being able to do so in a um, holistic and meaningful way, I think, you know, does wonders for your career and also your ability to put new um, processes and um, plans in place while also, you know, being able to have that constructive conversation to make sure you're driving towards the right solution not just your way. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's an excellent recommendation, uh, particularly, you know, often in operations, you know, you've got this wonderful jazzy workflows and, and it really is a complicated matter for, you know, people like me on the front lines where it's like, please, but just in, in simple language. <laughs> uh, Darren, yeah, it's been so. wonderful to, to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much um, for joining. Um, before we go, uh, if anyone wants to uh, connect with you, learn a little bit more about what you're doing at Instructure um, and ask any questions, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and just search uh, Darren Fay and um, I'm happy to chat with anybody. I love uh, networking and talking about RevOps, so awesome. don't be a stranger. Yeah. I know you're you're really um, active in a number of RevOps communities, so um, I'll include a link down below so it's even easier for everyone to find you. Um, Thanks, amazing, Darren. Thank you so much again. It's been an absolute pleasure, and to everyone that's listened to this week's episode, thanks so much. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Revenue Insights. If you want to learn more, subscribe to our newsletter, and we'll deliver every episode straight to your inbox. If you have any questions feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Our links will be in the episode notes. See you next week.